All right, this is our put it all together lesson. So we're gonna find all the stuff that we've been talking about throughout unit three. Um, and we're gonna use all that information to sketch a graph of this function given to us. So uh, we have a pretty challenging function here. This is a function that uh, you wouldn't really be expected to uh, know how to graph just off the top of your head. And, uh, but we're gonna be able to create a pretty nice looking graph um, once we've done everything that's asked here. So uh, the first three things are actually uh, pre cal Okay, so this isn't even stuff we learned in this unit. We learned it in pre-cal. Um, then increasing and decreasing, that was our 3.3. Um, so remember that those, we can find all of that based off the first derivative. Concavity and inflection points, we are gonna be using the second derivative for that. All right, so let's start at number one and get going. So x-intercepts happen when you set your function equal to zero. All right, so f of x is equal to zero. And so when you set a function equal to zero, you take, especially if it's a fraction like this, you take the numerator and set it equal to zero. And uh, that's pretty much all you have to do. That means our x-intercept is zero, zero. And if the x-intercept is zero, zero, that means your y-intercept has to be zero, zero. Okay, for the y-intercept, uh, you would plug, you would do x equals zero, you would plug in zero. And if you plug in zero for x, you get zero over square root of two. So zero, zero for both of those. All right, number one is done. Number two, symmetry. All right, so to test symmetry, you need to do f of negative x. Okay, so you're going to plug negative x into your function. So that would be negative x up here and the square root of negative x squared plus two. Okay, I'm just using a different color to plug my negative x in. All right, and then simplify it. So the negative x on top will just stay negative x, and then the negative x squared will become positive x squared plus two. And so you're looking for one of two things. Um, it either has to equal what you started with, so everything simplifies down and you get back what you started with. That is not what happened here. Uh, the bottom is the same, but the numerator is a, a negative. Okay, or it equals a negative times the function. Okay, and that's actually what we have here. Um, I could take that negative right there and put it in front like this, negative times, and then what would be left would be my original function. So this is equal to negative f of x. Okay, so that's one of the things we're looking for. Uh, what that means, what we just found is that this is an odd function. And that doesn't really answer my question. My question is about symmetry, but if you know it's an odd function, then odd functions are always symmetrical about the origin. I feel like I spelled origin wrong. Does it have an E? No, I like it better with an I. All right, symmetrical about the origin. Okay, number three, asymptotes. All right, so there are two types of asymptotes. There are your vertical asymptotes. So your vertical asymptotes happen when your denominator is equal to zero. Okay, so uh, this denominator, x squared, you know that a squared thing is always positive. And if you add a number to a positive number, it just stays positive. And so this never equals zero. Okay, if you start positive and you go more positive, you never go down to zero. All right, so the denominator can never be equal to zero. So that means we have no vertical asymptotes. All right, horizontal asymptotes. This is what you, to find these, you do a limit as x approaches infinity. Uh, we're actually gonna do two versions of this. We're gonna do one limit as x approaches positive infinity, and then we'll do another one where x approaches negative infinity. All right, so limit as x approaches infinity of x over the square root of x squared plus two. Okay, so any terms that are smaller than the biggest exponent term, you can ignore. So we're gonna ignore the plus two, doesn't matter when x goes to infinity. That's going to allow us to simplify this into the limit I'm going to go back to my purple. The limit as x approaches infinity of x over, and then the square root of x squared, not just an x, it's an absolute value of x. All right, and that is important because of our next step. Since x is going to positive infinity, you can replace the absolute value of x with an x, a positive x. Positive numbers on the inside will give you whatever's on the inside. All right, and then those cancel and you're left with 
1. All right, so we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1. Okay, and then we're going to do that same process again, but we're going to let x go to negative infinity. All right, so this is x over the square root of x squared plus 2. All right, I'm going to skip over a little bit of work here. So we have this work that we already did. All right, and then once we get to this step, it's this is where it changes. So when x is going to negative infinity, now instead of having an x on the bottom, you're going to replace the absolute value of x with a negative x. If you have a negative number inside your absolute value, then you multiply it by a negative, and that turns it into a positive, uh, which is what absolute value does. It turns everything into a positive. All right, and now if we simplify, that's equal to negative 1. So we have two horizontal asymptotes. We have y equals negative 1. All right, and I really should say uh, y equals 1 when x is greater than 0, and y equals negative 1 when x is less than 0. We could put an equal to on one of those, but I think that'll that'll handle it. All right, so we've done all of our pre-cal stuff. Um, I guess this was a little bit of calculus because we did the limit version. All right, so now we're to number four, increasing and decreasing. So we are going to find our first derivative. All right, so f prime of x is equal to... Okay, um, you could rewrite this and do the product rule. I prefer the quotient rule. I think it's a little easier to simplify if we do the quotient rule. So that's what I'm going to do. Low d high. So low is, um, I'm going to write it with an exponent form. x squared plus 2 to the 1 half power. And then d high is the derivative of the numerator, which is just 1. And then minus high d low. So high is our x. And then d low. We're going to multiply by the exponent, 1 half. We're going to keep the inside the same x squared plus 2. I'm going to subtract 1 from the exponent, negative 1 half, and we're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside, doing the chain rule. Then all of this is divided by our denominator squared, so I can just get rid of that square root and x squared plus 2. All right, we are going to have to do some work with this, so I don't want to leave it like this. I want to simplify it. Okay, there are situations where simplifying is going to be required, and this is one of those situations. So I have my x squared plus 2 to the 1 half, don't need the times 1, minus, all right, uh, the 1 half right here is going to cancel with the 2. So those are gone. I do have an x times an x. So I have an x squared on top, and then this whole negative exponent thing is going to go to the bottom, x squared plus 2 to the 1 half on the bottom. And then all of that is divided by my x squared plus 2. All right, so now I'm going to multiply the numerator by this denominator. So I'm going to multiply by x squared plus 2 to the 1 half power. And then I have to do that down here as well. All right, so what's going to happen is this is going to distribute all the way over here. And I get x squared plus 2 to the 1 half times another x squared plus 2 to the 1 half. So I get x squared plus 2. Okay, the 1 half plus the 1 half is 1, so this whole thing has an exponent of 1, and I don't need to write that. So I can even drop the parentheses because there's no exponent anymore. All right, and then minus, and then when I distribute to this term, they just cancel out, and I'm left with my numerator, which is x squared. Down here, I get x squared plus 2. Again, I'm adding the exponents. That's what I did here. I added 1 half plus 1 half. That's how I got my exponent of 1. Here I'm adding 1, if you kind of parentheses, has an exponent of 1. 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. Then we can do a last bit of simplifying. The x squareds cancel up here, and we get 2 over x squared plus 2 to the 3 halves. All right, so now we're finding where f is increasing, decreasing. We're also going to do number 5, where we find our relative extrema. Okay, and so all of that comes from um, locating your critical points. So critical points happen when your derivative is equal to zero. So you would take um, the numerator and set it equal to zero. All right, that doesn't make sense, right? So um, this, this can never be equal to zero. Um, we know our denominator is always positive because that x squared plus 2 thing we talked about earlier. And then the numerator is always just a constant, too. So uh, this is never equal to zero. So f prime of x does not equal never equals zero. So there are no critical points. So that means that there's not a maximum, there's not a minimum. Um, and in fact, we know that f prime is always going to be, well, the denominator is always positive. 
the numerator is always a positive and a positive divided by a positive. So f prime of x is always greater than zero. All right, so let's write out our justifications for number four and number five. Okay, so f is increasing. Increasing because f prime is greater than zero. So f is increasing on negative infinity to infinity, all real numbers. And the reason is because f prime is greater than zero. You don't, have, you don't even have to say on that interval this time because it's always greater than zero. One of the few times where that is true. All right, so that answers number four. And then number five, f has no relative extrema. Um, and we can give a reason because f prime does not equal zero. All right, so we're done with four and five. So now we're gonna move on to six and seven. And for six and seven, we're gonna use our second derivative. So we're gonna take a derivative again. All right, so f prime equals, I'm not gonna do the derivative yet. So this is f prime right here. And since I have a constant on top, I could do the quotient rule again, but I don't have to, and I shouldn't. It's much easier if you don't. So I'm rewriting f prime by bringing this up and making a negative exponent. So it's two times x squared plus two to the negative three halves power. Okay, so the reason I'm doing it this way is because I only had a constant and now I don't have to do the product rule, right? I can just use the regular power rule. It's much easier to do it this way than the quotient rule. So definitely look for opportunities to do that. All right, so multiply by negative three halves, the twos will cancel. So I get negative three in front, keep the inside the same. Subtract one from the exponent, so it becomes negative five over two. Don't forget your chain rule. Multiply by the derivative of the inside. Okay, let's do a bit of rewriting. Negative three times two x is negative six x. Denominator is going to be x squared plus two to the five halves. All right, so we can find where possible inflection points happen by setting our second derivative equal to zero. So f double prime of x equals zero when negative six x is equal to zero, which means that's where x is equal to zero. Okay, let's do a number line. Um, it, it could also be where f double prime is undefined, but again, we've talked about this a couple times now, the denominator can never be equal to zero um, because it's a positive plus a positive. So um, we, won't, we will not have any places where this derivative is undefined, where the second derivative is undefined. So x equals zero is the only possible inflection point. We are gonna plug numbers into our second derivative. Okay, so I'm gonna plug in negative one. That'll be a negative times a negative, which is a positive. And then we already talked about how this is always positive on the bottom. So it's a positive divided by a positive, which is a positive. And then I'll plug in positive one and uh, that'd be a negative times a positive, which is a negative. Always a positive on the bottom. So negative divided by a positive is a negative. And that means this is an inflection point. All right, so let's write out our statements for concavity and inflection points. All right, so F is concave up on negative infinity to zero. And we know that because F double prime is greater than zero on that interval. F is concave down. on zero to infinity. And we know that because F double prime is less than zero on that interval. All right, number seven, F has an inflection point at zero comma, and then we need the Y value, which we've already found because that is our X and Y intercept. 0, 0. So at 0, 0. And we know that because f double prime changes sign at that point. All right. I think we've done all of our writing and justification. We've shown all of our work. So the last thing left to do is to sketch this graph. All right. So I'm going to do that right up here. 
Okay, so I have a point at zero, zero. That is the only point we found this whole time. Kind of weird, but that's how it happened. All right, I have a, a vertical, no vertical asymptotes. I have two horizontal asymptotes. So I have y equals one, but that only goes to the right when x is greater than zero. And then I have y equals negative one, and that only goes to the left when x is less than zero. Okay. Um, F is always increasing, no relative extrema. Okay. And then concave up on negative infinity to zero, concave down on zero to infinity, and it switches concavity at zero, zero. Okay. So we want to start low and end high because we're increasing over our interval. Um, we're concave up right here. Let me switch my color. All right, so start low, concave up like this, and then we switch to concave down like that. All right, so this function is increasing the whole time. It's concave up, it's concave down, switches concavity right here at this point. All right, our derivative is never equal to zero. We have a slope the whole time. So there it is. All right, so you go from a function that you would never be able to graph by hand um, to something that you make an almost perfect graph by hand um, just by doing a little bit of calculus. So hopefully you enjoyed that, and I will see you for the next video.